involved in. No, this nation is a culture of immorality. The churches are a culture of immorality. And God says that the wrath is yet to come upon the children of disobedience. Just like in Revelation, it's poured out over and over again. Jesus didn't have any problem seeing the sins of the seven churches and told them, unless you repent, you will have your lampstand taken. Except you repent, you'll have your name blotted out of the book of life. You'll be spewed out of his mouth. He didn't have any problem seeing their sins. There's no magic cover. There's no paid in advance. Like I said, something paid for can't be forgiven anyway. That's how foolish you people think believing this nonsense you believe. If I, for, if I pay for your debt, if I pay it off for you, why would I have to come and say, well, I forgive you too? There would be no need for me. There'd be no need for anybody to come and say. So God had forgives sins on virtue of the mercy granted through reconciliation in the blood of Christ. Why? Because the blood of Christ can take away sin. The blood of Christ can purge iniquity. <coughs> And give people the fresh start that they need in this life. The washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. See, none of this stuff's ever going to change. None of this stuff is ever, ever going to change until people get themselves straight with God. And quit stop having to ask me, well, how do you do that? Well, what do you do? I mean, those are redundant questions. Rhetorical questions. What do you do? You take that step towards God. Certainly it's a different experience for every, every particular person, but in the same understanding that we forsake our sins and we come contrite and broken before God in a self-cleansing humility. That's what James 1, 21 and 22 is talking about. Laying aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness so we can receive with meekness the engrafted word that's able to save our soul. If that word was indeed engrafted into us at birth, as man has natural inclinations and a moral conscience at birth, not a sinful nature, as these, these phony pundits say, the light that was in every man that's born into the world, John 1, 9, if indeed that's the case, which I firmly say is the case, it's caught in the scriptures, well then that engrafted word needs to be planted and seeded and take root in the heart so it can spring up to a life and abundancy to produce an outcome. That's what the parable of the sower, as we talked about in one of our Bible study lessons. If you don't understand that parable, you don't understand anything. Because it takes the seed falling on ground that was prepared, a good and honest heart, it says, right? It's a good and noble heart, I think it used a King James Version. Well, the word noble just means honest. Honest that was prepared. The preparation of the heart belongs to man. A heart that was broken up and the fallow ground was broken. It was turned over. It was fertilized. It was watered. And then the word could take root and spring up. The reason the word doesn't take root in these people with this unconditional pardon and everything's done in advance is because of the hardness of their heart on the, the hard ground, on the rock or on the thorny, thorny pricklies of sin. Just like phony John MacArthur used to preach that il illustration, he may still do it, which I had on one of my old videos where the, your grapes are stuck on the thorns. But see, you still have fruit, but it's got stuck on the thorns because you listened to the teachers that told you you had to work. That's what he was talking about in that message, I remember. But how could, how could the fruit, it gets stuck on the thorns, what's going to happen to it? It's going to rot. So it's just like Jesus said, if the branch withers, it's what? It's broken off and thrown into the fire. See, every branch in me that brings forth, a produce, produces a result, then it's purged or it's trimmed and pruned so it'll produce more fruit. So the fruit, there always has to be, there always has to be a, a producing a continuing in the faith, a steadfast endurance. Those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Those will inherit eternal life. Those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey on righteousness, receive indignation and wrath. Again, just like Jesus said, according to the, that was, that was Romans 2, 7, and 8, which I quote all the time, and, Jesus, and it corresponds with John 5, where Jesus said that the resurrection of the just and the unjust were those that done good to the resurrection of life and those that done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Well, see, these people are doing evil. that think they've been unconditionally pardoned and that there's no condemnation no matter what they do because everything was paid in advance. I've told you people a hundred times. 
I've told you that listen to me and, and support my channel. When you hear Jesus paid for your sins from one of these pundits that you listen to, that means, that means, that's, that's a, a red flag should go off. A little bell should go bing, bing, bing in your brain. Because that means he's preaching a form of a penal substitution where sin was paid for in advance. That's a deadly error. That's not just a little bit of an error. That's something we can't agree to disagree on. That's a deadly error that renders repentance an afterthought, if at all. That's why we got all these people running around like Ken Hovind and other heretics running around saying, I've been hearing lately, that, well, it doesn't even, you don't even have to turn from sin. Repentance doesn't even mean you turn from sin. There's not, there's not a scripture in the Bible that says repentance is connected with turning from sin. Well, what are you turning from? If repentance means changing directions or changing your mind like you pundits keep saying, in the Greek, and that's all it means, of course, to you, well, what are you changing from? What are you fleeing from? If it's not sin. What do people in Nineveh repent from? See, why don't you ever... I've never heard any of these pundits talk about Nineveh in Jonah chapter 3 in the sense of the people turning from their wicked ways. Always in Nineveh or, or in Jonah messing up or not being fully obedient at first. No, because they can't have the people in their unregenerate state able to understand the importance imperative of turning from their sin and pleading with God, or that would mean that they're able to stop sinning and come clean with God. And that's exactly what they're able to do. Well, see, you've been beguiled, folks. You've been beguiled. With that word meaning paralegizomai as the word imputed. But this is the opposite of the reasoning and the thinking. Your reasoning has been twisted into a false sense of security. See, words, this is why Jesus said, For every idle word men may speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Because why? Well, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Well, you speak it into existence, your obedience from your heart. I believe I do. I believe I will obey. That's exactly what these things mean in the scriptures. So you could either speak false notion of security, you could speak condemnation unto a person by offering him this ticket, free ticket to heaven, or you can speak redemption to him. Just like John the Baptist, he spoke, he spoke these words when he introduced the gospel in Luke 3 and Matthew 3, where it says, and he said to the multitude, he said, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And don't say to yourself, we have Abraham as your father. For I say, God's able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Even now, right now, in Sodom, the called Washington, D.C., it's laid to the root of the tree, and you're going to go down with it. So therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So don't say you got a magic cover for your sin. Don't say that sin was paid for in advance. Don't say that Christians are sinning all the time. Because they're not Christians. Because God has not spoken it. So you bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Because at the judgment, you'll be standing naked and open to Him. With no advocacy then. Your robes are not going to be various shades of gray. No, the robes that are washed in the blood of the Lamb in Revelation 7, 14, they wash their robes clean and white in the blood of the Lamb, purged of their past sins and walking in present, present righteousness. Then again, seen in Revelation 19, that those same white robes and that linen is called the righteous acts of the saints. And then he says at the very end of Revelation, I'm coming quickly and behold, my reward is with me. Well, the reward, folks, is eternal life. The reward is those that endure to the end, that run that marathon all the way through, that work out their salvation, that run the race with endurance, that make their calling sure, like it says in the scriptures, without all this objections of so-called theology. Quit listening to the liars, folks because they're going to bring you the wrath of God on your head. And it's coming soon to this nation. Life is going to change radically, I fear. And many of us are going to live to see it. So come clean with God now, before it's too late.